Okay, continuing this study of the book of Titus, your King James Bible, we're going to start out here in verse 1. So you can take your Bible and go to verse 1 in Titus, the book of Titus. A lot of neat things to see here. All right. Let's get started. Titus chapter 2, verse 1. It says here, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Now, how do you speak things which become sound doctrine? I mean, wouldn't they be sound doctrine before you say them? Well, what's going on here, and what we're going to see as this study progresses, is this thing of younger Christians being taught by older, more seasoned Christians. See, for something to become sound takes time. You don't become sound right away. All right, if you are a novice, you're not sound yet. All right, you have to exercise your senses. You have to know things and memorize scripture and things like that. That's how it becomes sound doctrine. All right, I'll show you this thing here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You can turn over there, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Going to look at some interesting things here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Okay, it says here, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and, I, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Okay, let me just stop there for a minute. See, what we're dealing with here, the Corinthian believers, they were novices. They were, they were kind of uh, baby Christians, carnal. They had a lot of carnal issues and things. They weren't established in the faith. They weren't sound in doctrine. And... Very interesting because back in the old days of logging, they would actually check a tree for soundness. And what they would do is they would they called it sounding, actually. They would take a little axe and they would hit the log or they'd hit the tree. And the kind of sound that it came out of the tree, if it was kind of a hollow sound or a real solid sound, they would be able to tell if this tree is rotted on the inside or if it's a good solid tree. See, but they wouldn't, you can't sound a sapling, all right? It takes a large tree that you sound it, much the same way as a Christian, okay? There are seeds of truth that the Lord is going to plant in you over the years. And what happens is those seeds of truth get planted, and then other brethren can come along and they can water that thing. But that doesn't mean that you should worship those who preach to you. Get a hold of that one. Okay, And what happens is when you see people that are worshiping preachers, they get upset when their favorite preacher says something that they don't like. And then they start calling that preacher a heretic and things like that. Because, you know, my favorite little pet preacher said something that I didn't prefer. Um, if you've not learned this about this channel up until now, then learn it right now. And that is what? I'm not perfect what the King James Bible is. I'm not your standard, and I never can be. The book is. So if I say something that you don't believe lines up with the book, that doesn't make me a heretic, all right? It just makes me what I am. I'm a man. I make mistakes. I'm not perfect. The book is, all right? But don't just throw me out simply because I say one or two things that you don't like. I mean, if I was a heretic, you know, I'd be preaching another gospel and things like that. And, of course, some people, oh, you know, you preach Lordship Salvation. I've covered that thing before. I don't even bother answering it anymore because it's so ridiculous. I don't preach Lordship Salvation. All right. It's been covered in other studies. But the fact of the matter is here, for you to become a sound Christian is going to take time. That's why I don't believe in teenage preachers. In fact, I don't believe in early 20s preachers. Uh, if you follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, he started his ministry on earth when he was 30 years old. And I think that's a good age. All right. 
we're going to cover that more as we continue here. But let's continue in the verse here, or the passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Now look at this. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Do you see it there? I can preach something. Some of the other brethren on the internet can preach things. But the fact of the matter is it's going to be God that's going to reveal that truth to you. God's Holy Spirit of truth is the one that's going to have to come in and confirm whether what we're saying is true or not. Well, you say, well, how do I know? Does it line up here? All right. Does it line up there? If you say yes and the Lord confirms it, good. Praise the Lord. But you see, it's God who gets the glory, not me. Not pastor so-and-so or brother so-and-so or whatever. Uh-uh. Okay. Remember that. Verse 7. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So while I am not your final authority, I am going to be rewarded by the Lord someday for feeding the flock. And when you get to that certain time in your life where you can now go out and feed other people, you too are also going to receive rewards for the work that you do. All right? Simple to understand. Mark chapter 4. Go to Mark. Talking about here tonight how you can become sound in your doctrine. Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. How do you get to that point where you're a grown-up, mature Christian? Mark chapter 4, reading through verses 3 through 8. Okay, it says here, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Now look at verse 8. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, and some sixty, and some an hundred. Um, <clears throat> can a small sapling produce a huge bounty of fruit? No. What does it take for a fruit tree, we'll say, to produce a huge amount of crop? It takes years of growth, you see. Now, I'm not saying you have to be saved for 50 years before God can use you. I'm not saying that. I've known Christians that have been saved for a year, six months to a year, that are doing more for the Lord than people that have been saved for 20 years. All right. But the point is, it's about those seeds of truth. You're, you get saved and you hear about Catholicism and you go, oh, I want to study about that. And you study from this guy and from that guy and from that guy and from that guy and you study all these different people and you hear an ex-Catholic ex uh, nun or something like that and you hear, you learn some things from her and you learn this and you learn that and then you hear about the Bible version issue. See? The seed's planted and then you say, I want it to be watered by other people and that that thing that just it, you, you keep having seeds put in and then they're watered and then they grow and pretty soon you don't just have a tree you got a whole orchard that's producing fruit and that's what we're supposed to be as Christians we are supposed to bear the fruit of the Spirit see Galatians chapter 5 we are supposed to have fruit and it's interesting because if you read in the book of Matthew Jesus comes up to the fig tree which symbolizes Israel and he curses it why does he curse it? Because it's not bearing fruit. Now see, that's prophetically speaking about the nation of Israel, but instruction in righteousness, I'll tell you what, God doesn't think much of a Christian that's just a pew warmer, we'll say. God wants you to pr produce fruit. That's very important. Okay. Go next to Ephesians chapter 5. What did it say there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? It said about 
planting the seed and then uh, doing what to it? Putting uh, water on it? Well, what, uh, what for water do we have as Christians? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Ephesians 5, verse 26. That he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Did you know that a good fruit tree won't have many blemishes in the trunk? You start to introduce rot into that fruit tree, it's going to affect the type of fruit that's produced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You see, when a tree is getting the proper nutrients and enough water and everything, you know, you have to have moderation, you know, to have that thing. And you also have to prune some things, you know, get some things out of that fruit tree so it can produce more fruit. You know, there's so many analogies to the thing of producing fruit and trees. But the fact of the matter is a good sound tree that produces a lot of fruit is going to require a lot of water. You aren't going to find too many good fruit trees. You know, hey, look at this beautiful apple tree. It's just covered in apples out here in the middle of the Sahara Desert. No, there aren't too many fruit trees out there. Why? They need to be watered. And if you start to forsake this book as a Christian, you start to get away from reading this King James Bible, it will eventually start to affect the fruit that you produce. I guarantee it. So it's very, very important to stay by the book. Turn next to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. You have uh, two, basically, Gentiles. You have Titus, who's a Gentile, and Timothy, he's half Gentile, half Jew, half Gentile. But these two guys are in ministry. They're preaching. And Paul, as the older apostle, he is instructing these two young men. All right, Great instruction for you if you're wanting to be in ministry or in some kind of a ministry yourself. The books of 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus are excellent instruction for you. But look at verse 6 here. It says here, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Nourished up. You see it there? Kind of like a tree growing up and being nourished with those seeds of truth that are coming in and the water of the word. Very true. Turn next to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. Okay, it says here, but continue in the things that but continue thou in the things, excuse me, which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. You see, when you are a Bible-believing Christian, you'll learn a truth, and you'll see the evidence for it, and you see, hey, there's really no way to debunk this thing, okay? What you need to do at that point is you need to continue in it. Don't change, all right? Continue in the things that you've learned and been assured of. Those things that the Lord has shown you the truth about. Continue in that. And what does that produce? It produces things that become sound doctrine. See? When you first hear a lot of doctrines, they might sound a little strange to you. They might sound kind of like, well, I don't know, you know, I, I get a lot of people and they write to me and they're like, you know, I know the King James Bible is God's word, Brian, but, uh, you know, I just, I have these questions and I have this and I have that. You're going to have to get to the point where you are assured of this book being God's Word. Because if you go through your whole life questioning this book and saying, well, maybe it should have been translated differently, and maybe, it, maybe, maybe I, I don't know for sure, you're not going to amount to much. You're not going to produce much fruit. What you need to do is you need to say, okay, I've looked at the arguments. You know, the King James Bible was translated from the received text the majority of Greek manuscripts, extant Greek manuscripts, 
over 99% of them line up with this King James Bible, the readings in here. Um, it was translated over seven years, a seven-year period, 1604 to 1611. 54 men, a total of 54 great men, some of the greatest minds that have ever lived, worked on this translation. You know, they, each verse had to go through seven different tests. And then after 1611, it was refined even more as the English language was, you know, being refined itself and the, and the spelling and everything else was being standardized. So we have the edition that we use today, and this edition has been proved since 1769. It's been proved from then up until the present day. Um, don't you think that's a pretty good track record? You know, and when you can look at not just a handful of people, but you can look into the millions of Christians that have read this book and believed this book and lived by this book, and you can see the success that they have had in life. I'm not talking about huge, big church buildings and lots and lots of money. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about changed lives by from the pages of this book, this King James Bible. And you know what the strongest proof is? Why I stick with the King James Bible? Because the enemies of the King James Bible can't offer any perfect replacement. They're not saying, hey, these, this King James Bible is got a bunch of translation errors in it, and the NIV has fixed every single one of them, and now it's perfect, and we don't ever need to change it again. Uh-uh. They say, well, the NIV's better, but, you know, we're going to need to update it in a couple years. And then we'll need to update that, and then we'll need to update it, and then we'll need to update it, and then we'll need to update it. Um, wouldn't you eventually arrive at a perfect Bible? You know, with that philosophy, you should. I mean, if, if it's got errors and you can fix the errors, you should get to a point where you don't have any more errors anymore. And yet they can't produce a Bible like that. That's why I just scrap the whole new version thing and I say, King James Bible. I have been assured of my belief in this King James Bible and therefore I'm going to continue in it. I have been assured that the Roman Catholic Church is not the church that Jesus Christ founded. It's Satan's church. I'm going to continue in that belief. I have been assured of the fact that rock music comes from Satanism, voodoo, and witchcraft. It's a fact. It's a fact. I've seen it. Therefore, I'm going to continue in that belief. Why? I've been assured of it. You see, those things that I learned years and years ago, when I first started to research and study, when the Lord start, start, started to show me truth, those things I learned back then, I was kind of like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Those things, through being assured of those things, through being shown more and more proof, through seeds of truth being put into my mind and, and watering from different ministries, and God giving the increase, showing me why this stuff works, those things have become sound doctrine. You see how the system works. Don't think that you're going to have a mature Christian understanding of the Bible within the first week of being saved, within the first couple of months. It's going to take you a few years. Okay? This isn't some kind of a thing where you pull up to a drive through window and say, I want mature Christianity and I want it now. I know that's the mentality with a lot of American people. You want fast food religion. That's not Bible-believing Christianity. You know, it's, a, it's, it's something that is going to take a little bit of time. But we'll continue here. Go to Titus 2, verse 2. Start going down through here. And we're going to see the attributes now that you know that mature Christians is what you need to emulate as far as, you know, you need to kind of look towards mature Christians for your example. Now we're going to start to see what mature Christians, the attributes that they're supposed to have. All right, Titus 2, verse 2. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Notice there are six attributes of a sound, older Christian. First you have sober, then you have grave, temperate, sound in faith, charity, and patience. 
All right. You see those six things there. And of course, you know, if you see a older person, they should be sober. They shouldn't be wacky and goofy and just, I mean, you, you know, you can joke around and stuff. That's fine. I'm, I'm just saying there needs to be a serious side there. There needs to be, they need to be somewhat grave, okay? And meaning grave just means another word for serious, kind of a, you know, dignified is really what's going on there. Temperate, all right? You should see an older person that doesn't, that knows their limits, that has a lifetime of experience of eating too much, sleeping too much, drinking too much, whatever, you know, or too little. They're temperate. They're, they practice moderation. You should see that. And they should be sound in faith. They should have had a lifetime of experience of seeing the Lord work. So now they no longer have to question everything and they no longer have to say, well, what if it doesn't work? What if it doesn't happen? See, they should be sound in faith. They should also be sound in charity. All right? They should have that, that true sense of charity there of why are they living their life as a Christian. They're living it for other people, to serve the Lord, to do things for the brethren. Okay, you can read about that in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And they should also have patience. And if you think that patience comes quickly, you really have some things to learn. Uh, you're going to have to learn to be patient over the course of many years. Okay, and just when you think that you have learned patience, uh, the Lord will sometimes allow things to happen in your life that you're going to have to learn patience all over again. Okay, that stuff comes with age. And those are the things that you should look for as a Christian in an older Christian that you can learn from. I don't want to get ahead of myself here, though. Now look at verse 3. The aged women likewise... So not only are the aged men supposed to have these attributes, the women are as well. Look what else they're supposed to have. That they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. How can you teach good things if you've never learned good things? You have to, if you're a woman, you have to spend your you know, early life learning good things. Learning how to cook, learning how to be a good keeper at home, learning how to make things with your hands, learning how to be a good wife. Those are the types of attributes. If you're a young teenage woman, you should be concentrating and focusing on those skills, learning those skills. Not on which college should you go to. Not on which career should I choose in life. What car would I like to drive? That stuff is worldly. What you need to be looking for as a young Christian lady is, how can I learn to be a good keep her at home. Just give you a little story. The one time my mother was telling me this and um, right shortly after uh, my oldest brother, he's like 14 years older than me, uh, right after he was born, uh, she had moved, her and my dad had moved to a property, the property basically where I was raised and uh, down, down below Strasburg in Pennsylvania. And uh, they moved in there. They had built a house and everything and, and, uh, and just a real small little place. And there was an old farm woman lived up the road. And this old farm lady, she said to my mother the one time, she said, do you know how to can? You going to do your canning for the winter and stuff? And my mother said, she was from the city and she said, I have no idea how to can. And this older farm woman, she said, I'll tell you what. She said, you put your, your little boy there, you put him in a wagon with some jars, go out and have your husband get you some jars, and you come up here on such and such a day, and we're going to teach you how to can. And she came up there, and it was a bunch of older farm women that all got together, and they just cut up fruits and vegetables and things like that, and they canned all day long, worked hard all day long. They taught her a skill. They taught her a good thing to learn. See? As a young woman, you should seek to be around those kind of elderly women that can teach you how to do things with your hands. Can you learn it on your own? Yeah, sure. The Lord can show you those things on your own after you get married or something like that. Yeah, you know. Don't be a, you know, upset if, if you're watching this video and you're in your 30s or 40s and you've not really learned that many good skills and things. God can still show you that stuff. But what I'm saying is, a young woman should really strive to learn skills with her hands. 
don't be so interested in the career thing. Don't be so, and especially don't go to college. Good night. I mean, it's... but anyhow, let's continue here. Verse four and five, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. There again, we've lost a lot of that as Christians, as modern day Christians. Why? Because a lot of the elderly women, it's just like, oh, I, I don't want to do those things I've learned throughout my life. You know, I don't want to teach other, you know, younger women how to sew and how to, you know, can and how to store up food for the winter and whatever. I'm just going to sit around and play games, you know, because I, I did my work down through the years. and Now it's my time to enjoy life. That's a mistake. And what you're doing is you're robbing the next generation of the wisdom and the skills that you've learned. If you're an elder, elderly Christian woman, you need to pass those skills and those talents on to younger Christian women. Why? Well, look at the list there. Teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Just look at those three things. How many young women today are sober? Not too many. How about loving their husbands? A lot of young women are divorcing. Divorce rate is, you know, 50% of marriages ended in divorce. How about loving their children? Well, I love my child by sitting them in front of a television and letting them watch DVDs all day. Uh, that's not love, okay? That is called having some wicked television babysit your child and brainwash them into believing things that they shouldn't believe, you know? You say, well, what am I supposed to do? Go to an older woman, an older Christian woman, and have her tell you how to do things. You know, there are still a lot of Christian women around out there today that were raised in, you know, raising children in times when there weren't televisions in homes, in every home. And there's especially, we're not DVD players to put in DVDs of Barney or Sesame Street or, or whatever other thing. Those things weren't there. And as a young Christian woman, you should seek those older Christian women out and learn from them. But notice there too, it says uh, to be discreet. Discretion. That's something that's very important. Chaste. You know, uh, one of the, the great things about the Proverbs 31 woman, especially there, she's chaste. She's a virtuous woman. Her husband doesn't need to fear anything about her because he doesn't have to spoil her because he knows she, she's not going to run around on him and stuff like that. Why? She's chaste. Right? It's interesting too because the Bible says that we're supposed to, you know, that Paul wants to present us as a chaste virgin to Christ. What's chaste? Clean. Cleaned in mind. Cleaned in body. Clean in body. Clean in, you know, spirit. Clean. Chaste. Not defiled by the world. Keepers at home. There you go. How's, how about that one? You know, how about that for young women today? How many Christian young women are, believe, are, are looking towards their future as being a keeper at home? Many young Christian women, you know, they're looking at careers. They're looking at how can we have two incomes so we can have a bigger house and nicer vehicles and stuff like that. And again, I understand that there are women that get themselves into bad situations and they can't be a keeper at home because their husband leaves them or whatever else. They have to have a job. I understand that. Okay, There are all sorts of bad situations nowadays. I understand. I'm not coming down on you if you're not the perfect 100% role model Christian. I know that there are problems out there. I understand that. But again, this passage is, is specifically pointed to young women that are making plans for the future. And those young women, if you're watching this and you're a young woman, you need to seek the counsel of elderly Christian women. And if you are an older Christian woman, you need to seek out the young women that you can teach. And don't say, well, I just don't have time to teach. It's just, you know, I did that stuff in the past, but not anymore, Brother Brian. You know, I'm just, I'm too busy now. You know, no, you better make time. But let's uh, look here at 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 9 through 15. 
And again, we're going to see the thing here of older women versus younger women. Okay, it says, Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work, but the younger widows refuse, for when they be, have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And withal they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. Now you can go back to the 1 Timothy chapter 5 expository study if you want to hear more on that, on these specific verses broken down there. But the point is, you see again there in verses 9 and 10, you see the thing of an older widow. Okay, an older woman, and look at all she's done there. Well reported of for good works. She have brought up children, lodged strangers, Washed the saints' feet, relieved the afflicted, diligently followed every good work. See, there's a lot of good things that she's done. She is a woman that has a lot of experience that she can teach the younger women. See, that's a great gift. If God has saved you years and years and years ago and you've lived a lot of time and everything else, you know, you should pray about the Lord bringing some younger Christian women into your life that you can teach. You know, that's an important thing. Go back to Titus. Titus 2, verses 6 through 8. We'll read these verses here. Okay, and you say, well, this is just for the young women, right? Young women should learn from the older women, but certainly not the men. Now, let's keep reading. Verse 6. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Okay. Let me give you some really good advice if you are in your teens right now and you're watching these videos. Let me give you some real good advice. Hang out with elderly people. What? I want to hang out with my friends down at the mall. And guess what they're going to do to you? They're going to mess you up. You say, well, Brian, now, come on, how do you know that? I used to be a young person. I used to be around the, you know, popular crowd. I used to go and hang out at their houses and stuff, and we'd have the parties and the pornography and R-rated movies, and then the alcohol came in, and then some of them started fornicating you know, with girlfriends and stuff like that. I've been there, see. I've been there when they start to say, oh, you know, you're not afraid to do this, are you? Come on, man. You know, I won't use some of the language that they used to use, you know, and unfortunately I used to use, well, I was lost. You know, what do you expect? But back when I was a teenager, we did all kinds of stupid things. Got in trouble with the police, got in trouble with the law. You know, we were, we were a problem, teenagers, you know. But I was in the popular crowd, you see. So, I mean, I was in the in crowd, you know. That was a good place to be. It was the worst place to be. You know where I'd have been better off? At my grandparents' place. I wish I would have done that. You see, I was too smart to do that back when I was a teenager. I was too smart to be around my grandpa. Or my grandfather on my mother's side, I called him Pop Pop. I was too smart for them. Okay, they were just old people that didn't have a clue about our modern age, you know. Now I look back at that and I say, boy, I sure missed a lot. Both of my grandfathers are dead. One lived to be 82, I think. The other one lived to be 98 years old. Both of them were raised in homes that didn't even have electricity. Both of them raised in farms out in the country. I sure missed out on a lot not learning from him. I started to learn from the one that was 98. I learned a little bit from him in the later years of his life because I was starting to wise up a little bit. But I'll tell you what, there were many times that they wanted to talk to me and I was too cool for that, you know. Now I regret it. 
And I want to tell you right now, if you are a teenager and you have a grandfather, grandmother, even aunts and uncles and things that are older, you would do well to not hang out with your friends and go hang out with them for a while and ask them, what, was, what were things like back when you were young? Can you tell me about that? Do you have any skills I can learn? Can I help you around the house here? Hey, Grandpa, can I help you with some work that you're doing there? You're fixing that or doing this or doing whatever? Learn from them. Let me show you a verse that backs that up. Very important verse if you've never heard this one. Jeremiah chapter 6. Back to the Old Testament. You can listen to my sermon too, by the way, about, uh, I think it's called God's Gift of Elderly Christians. And uh, see that actually a curse that God placed on some people in the past, a whole family, was because they basically were, you know, they didn't have any elderly people in their family. The young men would grow to a certain age and then they'd die. So they never had an elderly uh, man or woman in their home. And that was actually a punishment from God. It's important to understand that thing. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. That's what a lot of teenagers say. You're looking at one. Hey, Brian, ask for the old ways. I'm not walking in that. Hey, man, I don't want to go to Grandma and Grandpa's house tonight. I want to hang out with my friends. Yeah. And my friends almost got me killed a couple times. You know, I'm going to be doing my testimony in the future. I was in car accidents because of my friends. Because they were too stupid to go slow. You know, fortunately, I praise the Lord that it was never a result of alcohol or drugs. But we did some really, really stupid things as teenagers. I'd have been a lot better off going out and hanging out with my grandparents. A lot better off. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 32. Leviticus 19, 32. It says here, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head, in other words, the head, head that has gray hair, and honor the face of the old man, and fear thy God, I am the Lord. That's in the Old Testament, under the law. We don't have to pay attention to that today. Well, then you're foolish, okay? Because you read that thing and you see it the whole way through the Bible, the thing of honoring the elderly. I mean, doesn't the Bible, one of the commandments say that you're to honor thy father and mother? Yeah, why? That thy days may be great upon the earth, you know? How are you going to ever learn anything if you're learning from people that don't have any experience? See, you know the older people that have the wrinkles and they have the scars and things like that? You know what that comes from? Time and learning and experience. And you know the beautiful thing about learning from people that are scarred and wrinkled and things? Is you can avoid a lot of those scars yourself. The older people go through some hard times and some hard lessons and things like that. And if you're wise enough to listen to them, you can avoid some of those same mistakes that they made. That's why the Bible says over here in the New Testament, the things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. You know one of the best ways to avoid problems in the New Testament? Learn from the mistakes of the Old Testament. You know what's wrong with America right now? America has become a pagan nation. You know what the mark of a pagan nation is? It's over in Acts chapter 17. We're not going to go there, but you can read about it. They spent their time in nothing else but to hear or tell some new thing. You know what's wrong with America? Their Americans are obsessed with new things. Did you see the new 2014 Chevy Corvette? 
oh man, I saw one the other day. It was just amazing. I mean, I was at the store. We were buying this new TV because my TV's not big enough anymore. It's a 60 inch and we had to get the 72 inch. I mean, and then I saw this brand new Corvette and there was a guy pulled into and he had a brand new Dodge Dually diesel. I just saw the thing just came out this year. Who cares? Another five years, it's going to be outdated and junk. What are you spending your time getting all worried about new things for? You know what the things that should excite you should be? Old things. Again, there's another problem. And I'm going to rant here for a little bit, so just, you know, get ready for it. One of the problems with America, another problem with America, is we've become dependent upon machines and technology. And the interesting thing is, the intriguing thing, when you go back 100 years ago, people didn't even use this stuff. There's, you know, 20 years ago, people were living totally different than they do today. You know, today. You have things today that a lot of people can't live without that people 10 years ago didn't even own. And what's going on? It's making people more dependent. You know? I mean, my wife and I currently are living in a place that does not have running water. It has a well in the basement, a shallow well. People go, how can you live? Oh, oh, how can you live? It's called go down and get a dipper and you get a jug. Here, I'll show you. You get a jug like that, okay? Yeah, I got a jug right over here, you know? You fill it with water and then you open the spout and the water comes out. And when the water's gone, you go down and you fill it up again from the well. Oh, how very primitive. Yeah, but guess what? It keeps you out of debt. See? Learn from the old ways. Learn from the old paths. I'll tell you what, one of the most blessed things out there is non-electric types of tools and technology. You, it's a fascinating study. Absolutely fascinating. And you see, if you've ever been in a power outage, you understand that helpless feeling that comes when all of your electrical appliances do not work. You go over and you flip the switch, nothing comes on. There's no light that comes on. You go over and you, I can't use the toilet because it, it doesn't work unless you have public water. You know, I can't do this and I can't do that. I can't cook anything. I can't get on the internet. I can't, you know, see, you're helpless. You become a slave at that point in time. And of course, it's Bible prophecy that it's going to be the whole mark of the beast. They can't buy or sell unless they have a stupid microchip, you know. See how people have become dependent. So, I'm going off here, folks. This is an area of very strong passion for me. But <laughs> I love the non-electric thing. I love the thing of, you know, not being dependent. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have things that are electronic. I have to be in ministry. That's what I do. All right, but I'm never going to get to the point where I'm crippled if I don't have those things. I study these things. I see things are getting bad, and what do I do? I ask for the old paths. And if I can find an older Christian that is a farmer or some kind of a machinist or some kind of somebody that's been through some things, I will sit down and talk with them as long as they will let me talk to them. Why? Because I want to learn from them. I love to learn from older Christians. And if you're a teenager, skip the thing of being around your friends and wanting to be around youth and stuff like that. Find some older Christians. Find some older people to be around and learn from them. It's the best advice I can give you. But getting back to the study, I could talk for about four hours on that subject, but... Uh, We'll get back to it. Titus chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Go back to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Okay. Question. What is purloining? What does that mean? Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines purloining, purlo purloining, I'll get it out yet, as stealing. Committing literary theft. 
Another definition it has here, noun uh, theft, plagiarism. Very interesting. You know what one of the things that's very tempting to do when you are working someplace as a servant, you know, and I realize in context here, the, the Bible we're going to see about this, you know, the, there is the thing of, in the Bible times, they did have bond servants, you know, slaves, the modern day slave. Okay, and it's many times when you read servant, it's talking about the, the servant and master relationship. But you can still use this thing for instruction and in righteousness if you're a man and you have a job and you have an employer. Okay, you're still under some of that same relationship there. So there is some instruction in righteousness. But you see, one of the ways that you can steal from your boss is by not being honest with your time card, you know, if you write it or whatever, you know, if you have the little thing you just to, you know, stamp it or whatever. Well, you can't be as dishonest then, but even then you can go out and you can hang out and not really be doing your job, you know, that kind of thing. The fact of the matter is you're supposed to be a good worker. And you know, what my advice is for younger people, younger men, I should say this, younger men, my advice is learn how to use your hands, learn how to work with your hands. You say, well, shouldn't I be studying the Bible? Oh yeah, you do that on the side. But learn how to be a good worker. Learn how to use your hands, how to learn hand skills and things like that. How to repair motors, how to build things with wood, how to build things with metal, how to weld, how to... There's so many things that you can learn with your hands. And how do you learn those? By having a job and working hard. You know, I didn't graduate high school and go into ministry, okay? I worked as a cook. Um, I worked as a dishwasher. I mean, I cleaned tables, you know, at restaurants and things. Um, I went into boat building, you know, and I learned how to fabricate metal and with wood. I worked at cabinet shops. I've built furniture. Um, I went into business for myself, worked as a wood turner, uh, worked in logging, worked in the logging industry. I, I sold firewood for a number of years. You know, I've learned a lot of things with my hands way before I even thought I was even called into ministry. So, and what was it all about? It was about the Lord developing character in me. And it's interesting because the Bible actually says that Jesus Christ, they said, isn't this the carpenter? They called Jesus Christ a carpenter at one point in time. See, why? Because he was good at working with his hands. He worked a regular job before he started his earthly ministry. And I really think that part of your education, so to speak, as a Christian man is to have a job and to work various jobs, to work, learn good skills with your hands. Okay, Christian young lady, you're to be a keeper at home. I'm not telling a Christian young woman to go out and have various jobs and things like that. A Christian young woman, learn to crochet, learn to knit, learn to cook, learn to clean, learn to write, learn to... There's a whole lot of things that you can learn. I mean, there is no end of skills that you can learn as a young Christian woman. See? Very important to, to do these things here. Look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. First Timothy 6, verses 1 and 2 says here, let as many servants as are under the yoke, see there you have the bond servant, count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved, uh, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. That's what I'm doing right now. I am teaching you what the word of God says, and I am exhorting you. If you are a young person, the exhortation to you is work hard. If you're a young man, I recommend going out into the workforce, be self-employed. There's a lot of things that you can do. You know, learn from older men. If you're a young woman, be a keeper at home. Help your parents, help your family. Go stay with your grandparents for a while. See, go stay with an aunt or uncle that needs help. Learn how to do something around the home. Those things are important. Next go to Colossians 3. Colossians 3, verse 22.
Colossians 3, 22 through 25. We'll read this real quick here. It says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. You know, the Bible says that by the Lord Jesus, you know, it basically says by Him all things consist. Now, that business that you're working for, if the Lord decides to shut it down, it's going to be shut down. So who is really the one that's in control of that business? The Lord. So you're really, in reality, working for the Lord. And if you want His will in your life, don't worry about, you know, i got to make myself a success in ministry. Don't do that. What you need to do is you need to say, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do right now? Well, go work at such and such a place. Okay, while I'm there, I'm going to keep reading your word. I'm going to keep studying your word. I'm going to learn what I can. I'll learn to work with my hands. And guess what? When the Lord says, okay, it's time for you to move on from that position, He'll close the door and open a new one. He will di direct your path through life. That's what He'll do. All you have to do is just do your part. Work hard as unto the Lord and learn from older people. Very important. Go to Titus 2, we'll read verse 11. Okay, it says here, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to the elect. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't read that right. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all Calvinists. The elect Calvinists. Um, no, it says uh, to all men. You see, if you don't know what Calvinism is, Calvinism teaches that there's a limited atonement. Jesus didn't die for everybody. He only died for the elect. And if you're one of the non-elect, that God has predestinated you to hell, and there's nothing you can do to get saved. Calvinism is ridiculous nonsense. All right? Let me show you some other verses here on this issue. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Acts 17 verses 30 and 31. Okay, it says here, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. You know what the word all means? It means all. You say all of the elect. The word of the elect is not in the text. It means all men. And notice it says there, he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world. Um, how can you judge somebody when they have no say in the matter? God would be an unjust judge if he judged the non-elect. If you have somebody who's non-elect comes up there before God and the Lord says, Depart from me, cursed and everlasting fire, prepared, prepared for the devil and his angels. The non-elect person would say, Well, yeah, you know, why are you judging me? I didn't have a chance to get in. You create, you know, you created me this way. You, you made me a non-elect, you know, so what was I supposed to do? So it doesn't make any sense. No, salvation is available to all men and it is up to their free will whether or not they get saved. All right? They have to come to God as a sinner and accept the blood atonement to pay for those sins. That's the issue. Titus 2, verse 12. Continuing on here. Titus 2, verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly, there's that word again, righteously and godly in this present world. Let's go next to Romans chapter 12. 
He asks the question, well, uh, how do I live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world? You know, the Bible talked there about worldly lusts. How do you stay away from that? Well, the place that most young people are going to pick up the worldly lusts and pick up the things of not living godly, soberly, righteously, you know, is from your friends, your teenage friends. I'm going to show you that. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man, the measure of faith. Let me just give you another little important thing that you need to remember. Okay, a little exhortation. No successful Christian can be a conformist. Not one time in a million years are you going to find a Christian that's ever done anything for the Lord that cares about what the world thinks about them, that cares about the styles of the world, that cares about doing what the world thinks is popular. If you want to succeed as a Christian, and again, I'm not talking about millionaire or something like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if you want to get to heaven and have rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, you cannot conform to the world. And isn't it interesting that the greatest group that does not conform to the world are the elderly people? They're the ones that, you know, you ask them about the things, the, the trends of the world, and they're just like, I have no idea about any of that stuff. Interesting. Because if you're a younger person and you learn from an elderly person, you're not going to conform to the world. Hmm. Very interesting. All right. Go back to Titus 2, verse 13. You say, well, uh, What's the best way to stay motivated to serve the Lord? Well, we're going to read it here in this next verse. Titus, come on here. Titus 2, verse 13. What is our motivation as Christians? Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hmm. You mean a great motivation should be that Jesus Christ could come back at any time? You know, if you're looking for something, it doesn't mean that you uh, only occasionally think about it. Do you ever lose something in a room? What do you do? You look for it. What does look for it mean? That means you just kind of stand there and, you know, or maybe you lay down and take a nap. No. It means that you are diligently searching for it. You're looking everywhere. I wonder if it's under this, or maybe I'll try that. Or You're looking. Action. Active. You're active. When you see things happening in the world, and I see it, you know, a lot of you in your comments talk about this. I've written back and forth with some of you, and I see that thing in you. And that is you see some major event that's happening, and you say, praise the Lord, it's not going to be long now until the rapture. What are you doing? You're looking forward to Jesus coming. You are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Did you know it's going to be a glorious appearing? I mean, we just read through these verses. That's why I make, you know, you say, well, of course I know that, Brian. It's what the text says. Think about it, though. Think about the glory that shall be revealed at that time. When you actually all of a sudden, right now, it's, you know, we have faith in the Word of God and we you know, believe by faith and things like that. And, of course, you know, there's a lot of proof in the Bible. I'm not saying you have to believe blindly or something. No, there's a lot of proof in this book. But this is our only physical connection to the Lord. But all of a sudden, that day is going to happen and you hear your name called and you go, oh, and all of a sudden, boom, and you're there and you're in the clouds and you're going, and we're all looking around at each other like, what just happened? 
and we're looking. This was this. This was the rapture, wasn't it? This wasn't a false alarm. This is the rapture. And, oh, and you, and you start. It starts to dawn on you, and all of a sudden you look over, and there he is, Jesus Christ, for the very first time. Glorious appearing. <laughs> you know, what an amazing day that's going to be. Absolutely amazing. And you see, if you keep that in the back of your mind, you're going to think to yourself, what do I want the Lord to find me doing when that time happens? Hanging out at the mall with my friends? Telling dirty jokes? Hey, why don't you try a cigarette, man? Hey, you want to you want a sip of my beer? Hey, check this out, man. Check out what I found on the computer. Look at this thing here. I mean, you aren't going to believe it. Or would you rather be hanging out with some elderly Christians? Being there to encourage them. Being there to learn from them. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Be an amazing thing. Let's look at uh, 1 John chapter 3. See this thing here again about this being a purifying hope. The blessed hope is a purifying hope. 1 John chapter 3 verses 1 through 3. It says here, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now look at this, verse 3. And every man that hath this hope, it's read about the blessed hope there in verse 13. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Ask for the old paths, where is the good way? You know how you purify yourself? By asking for old things. Like the uh, old King James Bible. Think about that. Very important. Titus 3, verses 14 and 15. It says here, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Are you peculiar? I hope so. I hope that the world thinks that you're peculiar. Because if you're not, if you're conforming, if you're fitting into the world, I can tell you God's not using you. If you care about hanging out with your friends and, and fitting in and you know everybody laughs at your jokes and now oh, you're really cool and everything, you're messing it. You're messing it big time. They should look at you and they should say, Hey, where's uh, you know, so and so, whatever your name is. You know what I heard? I heard he's at his grandmother's house. What? Yay, yeah, something like he's over there learning, you know, working out in the garage or out in the shop with his grandfather. <laughs> oh brother, what a weirdo. Peculiar. See? Oh, you know, where's, where's, uh, what's her name? She's at home. What's she doing there? Well, she's cooking and cleaning. And uh, between that, she's reading her Bible. Huh? You mean, you mean, uh, you know, her? Yeah, oh yeah, that's what she's doing. Says she wants to be a keeper at home someday. Huh. That's what we're supposed to be. It's a great challenge to all of us. Lastly, we're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And these verses are some of the best verses, I think, for today, for Christian service. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Remember what we read earlier? That we're to, what did it say over here in Titus chapter 2, verse 1? Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Over here, 
They will not endure sound doctrine. Hmm. And today in this American culture and the UK and a lot of the other countries out there, Australia and I'm sure, you know, Germany and, you know, most of your countries out there, Canada and things, people worship the youth. Why would you worship the youth? The youth don't know what's going on. It's the elderly people. See, they don't, they don't, they don't, don't want to endorse sound doctrine. They don't want to look at those, those elderly people that have been through the hard times. Interesting. Verse 3, But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Kind of like hanging out with other teenagers. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Hey, let's go watch a movie. <laughs> yeah, that's real smart. You know, and again, I did it for years and years and years. Wasted a lot of my life away in front of a television set. Sad. Verse 5, But watch thou in all things endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Let me ask you a personal question. Do you love the appearing of Jesus Christ more than anything else? Is there something that you would like to do right now that uh, you're hoping that the Lord doesn't come back so that you can get that thing done? I have to ask myself that question. You know, there's a lot of exciting things going on in, in, you know, my wife and I in our life right now. And, you know, sometimes it starts to fade a little bit. You start thinking to yourself, I got all this stuff to do and, you know, I got all these things. Oh, what about the Lord coming back? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I want that. Yeah, yeah, you know. It's a challenge to all of us. What mental state are you going to be in when Jesus Christ actually calls us out of here? It's rough. There's a lot of things in this world that can get your eyes off of Jesus Christ. A lot of things. And again, like I said, I am preaching just as much to myself as I am to anybody else. All right? And I'll tell you what, the older I get, the more I want to learn about old things and the way things used to be. Because I see... The more of this modern technology, the more of this modern system that goes away, the less clutter there is up here in my mind so I can focus on the things that are most important, like Jesus Christ coming back. You see, because when I realize the way this world is headed right now, and I see the technology and things, and I see how bad it is now, and I remember back from my own childhood, we were a lot freer back then, and it gets worse and worse and worse. I know what technology is. Technology is shackles. It's chains. It's making you a slave. I mean, how ridiculous is it to have a professional computer that I rely on every day and it blue screens, and I'm still working on that, by the way. I'll be making an update video on it. But it blue screens and I can't work. Are you kidding me? You know? I mean, I have chainsaws. I have a number of chainsaws. I mean, my channel's named after a chainsaw, you know. I'm peculiar. If those things break down, well, I know how to work on the motors and stuff like that. I can clean the carburetor, work on it a little bit, you know, and, you know, change the plug, you know, clean the air filter, you know, replace the pull cord, whatever. I can do a lot of maintenance on a chainsaw, but it could get to a point where it totally breaks down. I got a useless, you know, use it as a boat anchor or something there. Why? It's technology. The old timers would use an axe. And if that handle broke when they were out in the field, they'd make a new one. And it gets dull, you have your file, you sharpen it. The only reason that your axe doesn't work is if you run out of energy. You know, there was an old man, I'll just tell you this story in closing. There was an old man down near where I grew up, down below, below Strasburg, Pennsylvania. And 
I remember the kids, you know, we bad kids and stuff, you know, we'd be going around the neighborhood and, you know, doing things which we shouldn't be doing, you know, making trouble and vandalizing things and whatever else. And there was this old man in this property and nobody ever, you know, was just like, stay away from that guy. He's creepy. You know, he's an old, nasty old man. And I always thought he was half nuts because that's what all the kids said. We always thought that he had some kind of mental problems and just stay away from him. He's crazy and all this. And found out he died, you know, and, and uh, we were all just like, oh, you know, whatever. And the farm got sold. And years and years and years later, when I was really starting to study the old ways and the old things, I found out what that old man was. He was one of the last remaining hand tree fellers out there. A real lumberjack from the old days. He never used chainsaws. He used crosscut saws and axes. You talk about a wealth of information that that old man would have been just to be able to go and respect that old man like we should have been doing and learn from that old man. And what happened? He died. And with him died his years of accumulated wisdom. And instead of going and actually having a conversation with that old man and showing respect to that old man, we disrespected him as teenagers and we missed out on learning a great amount of truth. I had a grandfather that was very much the same way. He wasn't a logger, but my grandparents, both grandfathers were amazing men. And I could have learned a lot more from them if I would have been wise enough to do that. And you say, well, I don't understand what this has to do with the rapture. It has to do with the rapture because when you take your eyes off of technology, you begin to look at the world around you and you begin to start to realize how things are and realize, hey, we're not going to be able to get back to the way things should be in this world, even though you can learn some of that stuff, you know. But I'm saying the majority of people are headed straight to hell right now. The majority of people are running full scale, you know, headlong into taking the mark of the beast. The technology is there. And so seeing the old ways, seeing the way it's supposed to be on the earth, you know, seeing those old ways makes you realize Jesus Christ has to be coming back soon. I'm going to stay focused on that. I'm not going to let my mind get distracted by all the technology and the latest, the latest and the greatest and new. And, and do you have a Generation 4 iPod? Well, no, I'm going to, I'm going to wait for the Generation 5. And, and I'm going to get this and I'm going to get that. And mine's a touchscreen and Windows 8 and I got... The... See? See? Stay focused on older things. Stay focused on Jesus Christ coming back. That's what Titus chapter 2 is all about. Learning from the elderly and respecting the elderly. You know one of the reasons I went through a lot of hard times growing up, why I had to learn a lot of hard lessons, is because I believe it was the Lord paying me back, punishing me for how I treated older people in my youth. Again, you better think about that. If you have an older grandparent that you don't pay any attention to, you better repent of that thing. Start showing them some respect. Start learning from them. And seek to be a peculiar person. That's going to be it. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for all the things that you have shown me and that that uh, you continue to show me. And many times, Lord, it's through people that are online. And, and uh, some of my viewers, Lord, are, have a great deal of wisdom. And I really thank you for them. And especially the older viewers that I have that tune in, that, that um, watch these videos, Lord, and they comment and they write to me and things. I always appreciate that. And I learn a lot from them. And, and I learn a lot from my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I, I just thank you, Lord, to be part of this uh, body of Christ. I just It's an amazing thing to be saved, Lord, and I thank you for it. But Lord, I just want to pray that there, if there are some young people out there, if there are some teenagers, I pray, Lord, that they would not follow in my footsteps and in the footsteps of many people here on YouTube that have messed up their teenage years, Lord, with, with all kinds of sin and wickedness. I pray, Lord, that if there are any teenagers out there hearing my voice right now, that they would 
that your Holy Spirit of truth would come upon them and, and prick their conscience, Lord, and, and make them want to learn from older people. And uh, not worry about what their friends say. Not worry about being popular or anything else. But that they would get away from their teenage friends and, and start to want to be around the elderly. And want to show honor and respect to their parents and especially to their grandparents. And Lord, to get back to the old ways. To get back to the old King James Bible. But most of all, Lord, I just pray that, that uh, we would none of us would lose focus of your imminent return, Lord. And, and that we would... Uh, Seek to please you with our lives. And uh, just thank you again, Lord, for your word, for the challenge from it. And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, that's going to be it. As you might have been able to already tell, the yellow wall has turned into a chroma key green screen. That's why there's a different background behind me right now. I uh, figured people were probably getting tired of looking at a yellow wall, so... Still experiment with some new video stuff here. Um, we're going to have quite a few different setups in the future um, for doing multiple different types of videos. Uh, we're going to stay with this technology, the double-edged sword of technology. We're going to stay with it as long as the Lord has us in this thing. Um, we'll see. We'll see what the Lord has in the future. Um, just really praying for those out there that uh, uh, that are young. Um, I sure wish some people would have come to me and told me uh, things that I had learned the hard way. And uh, don't get cocky, don't get arrogant when you're young and you think that you know everything. You don't. And you will learn. If you don't learn from elderly people when you're young, you're going to have to learn those lessons the hard way. And you don't want to learn them that way. Uh, I can assure you of that. Uh, learn from the elderly. That's very important. So that will be it. We have uh, uh, some really neat stuff coming out in the future here. Um, recently had a brother send me a whole bunch of uh, books and Bibles and things like that. and I've been finding some interesting information. I've been, I've been going through that. Plus I have other things that were on the back burner there, you know, that are you know, going to be coming out. Right now, of course, we have the whole unpacking thing and all that stuff that's going on. So... Working on a lot of different issues right now, um, trying out new things, working on stuff. So uh, just please keep us in your prayers, and uh, thank you to all who have donated. And um, I guess that's going to be it, and uh, we will see you in the next video.